you got your Bibles, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. This is part 2 of Ascension. Started last week. The text is Ephesians 1 3. You don't need it, there, it's on your outline, but where we're going to be looking at is not on your outline. Again, some of these scriptures we're looking at is not on your outline, so you just have to put them on there if you want to reference them down the road. Ephesians 1 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's where we, we're seated. We talked about that last week. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ. That's where all the blessings are in heavenly places in Christ. And if you look at the top, it says ascension. It's where we're seated, endowed, authorized, and empowered. So we're living from God's throne on earth. We're in heaven and on earth at the same time where we looked at that last week. We need to understand you're living from the place He seated you. If you look up here at the board, the cross is in the middle, and we're looking at the death and burial, then we go to resurrection, then ascension. So we're born again, raised to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you can't you can't live successfully if you don't go from resurrection to ascension. You need to know where you're placed at once you're born again. And you live from there. If you don't know ascension, you're not going to live from there. And then you get into the blood, his name, his life, and his utterance. Because all that comes from the ascension. Because after the resurrection, he applies the blood. And then we're in him. You just saw that. In him, in heavenly places. So his name is his authority, his life. And then his words speaking his utterance. And once we get done with this, and actually, um, I started working on the website last week, or, yeah, this week. And two series are going to kind of run together. What we're doing here is the New Covenant series since March. I don't know how many. There's a lot of them. Probably 30-some, 40 messages so far. And that's under the New Covenant series. However, what we started about four or five weeks ago that we're integrating with the New Covenant series um, is the cross. So I'm going to keep the cross with the New Covenant series, but we're also going to have on the website a separate page where it's just the cross, and then there's going to be a lot of other stuff on there besides what we did here. So when it's all said and done, what I'm saying is on our website, we're going to have a web page on the cross, and that is what I wish... Everybody would go through once they're born again. I wish somebody would have done that. What we've been doing since the death and burial. So in other words, when you go to the cross, you're going to see messages on death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and these other ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. What we're doing here is we're integrating the cross with the new covenant because the cross is the new covenant. But the reason why I'm separating the cross from the new covenant on the website is because if someone gets born again, I don't want to bog them down with a new covenant series. Okay, so what I, how I'm seeing it, and I want our website to be a place where people can be discipled. This is why I'm doing it. Is if you get somebody born, and the reason I'm telling you this, because if you ever get somebody born again, you lead somebody to the Lord, then we want to lead them to the messages of the cross. Then after that, they can jump over to the new covenant series that we started in March. And then they can work all the way up to the cross in the New Covenant series and then continue on because it'll be good to redo that again. What I'm saying is after they're done with the cross and the New Covenant series, that individual is going to be so solidified in Christ and be years ahead of you and I, you know, in, in growth when we got born again. So it's taken me 40 years to get to this place. 40 years to get to this place because it's not being taught. It's like I had to reinvent the wheel, not me personally, but it's nice when someone invents the wheel and you can jump from there. So hopefully that will work for people, and I think that it will, is that when someone gets born again and they just go through, and it probably will take them a year, six months to a year, depending upon their time, it's all on demand. They will in one year 
have what it took me 40 to get. Now, one year to 40, that's huge. So is, or is God in the days to come, or years to come, accelerating something here in the church? Because what has taken ministers years to get to this place, new born-again Christians can get there in a year. So there's an acceleration. And uh, so, I don't know, I think we're living in a good time right now because though outwardly, in this world it doesn't look good, but the kingdom, God is giving us revelation. So I, I, I think that that's a good thing. But I'm telling you this because if you ever get someone born again, we on our website have messages and videos to lead them, to disciple them if they don't come to church. And even if they do come to church, let's say somebody gets saved at the church. I'm going to turn them on to this stuff on the website. On the website. I, I can't redo this all the time in church. So there's a platform that they can go to and get discipled. <clears throat> Make sense? Now I want to start off, and I want you to visualize this as an analogy as we get into the message. Think about one of the latest wars we were in is the Vietnam War, and that included a draft. So picture that. There's a draft. And we send these guys to boot camp. They didn't volunteer, so they are placed in the army, and they're at boot camp. But let's let's tweak this a little bit and say that they're not being trained for war. They're not getting weapons like an M16 to to know. I don't know what they do, but they, let's just say they don't do that. They just get talked to. They just have classes. And they don't. They're not out there. You know, they're, they're given you know an outfit. And then they get lectured. That's their boot camp. And then when they're sent out into the, the field to fight, they have no weapons. They're not allowed to kill. But they have to show up for the fight and they've got the uniform on. And the generals have no power and no authority. But they've got people under them. How can you win a war? You're all dressed up. You look good. But you got no weapons. And you have no power and authority to advance the enemy and destroy his works. Isn't that what war is for? That is exactly the church. We don't, we, we don't have a boot camp. That's called The boot camp really is what I'm telling you in the beginning. Get them on the website and get them solidified in the cross. That's, that's the boot camp. But we don't have that. What we do when we get people saved, we get them turned on to rules, regulations, and motivate, motivate them, put them in programs, and... They don't even know nothing about the, the, the cross, let alone the new covenant, which is the cross. But anyway, but, but can you imagine an army that is not equipped? When you, see, when you see what Jesus did on the cross, this is all him. Not just putting a uniform on us called new man. Okay, We all know we're a new creation. But what does that mean? That means we're raised... New creation, but if you don't understand ascension and where we go from here, then you're you're literally that guy on the field, all dressed up, no weapons, no power, no authority, completely vulnerable to your enemy who's coming at you. And all you can do is hide out, hope and survive. And that's that's where the church is at. This is why this is so crucial that we understand this message. Alright? So let's jump into it. Um, Genesis chapter 1 is the beginning. And this is Adam and Eve in the garden. Listen to what God... He placed them in a garden. And look what He says to them. He equips them. Now watch. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have what? Dominion. Dominion. You know, there's a huge sect of the church made up of many denominations who don't preach dominion. It's hold the fort till Jesus comes with white knuckles. And the church is in survival mode, not in dominion mode. So he says he's going to place man in the garden and give him power and authority called dominion. You see that there? Huh? Huh? Now, they don't have sinning flesh. They don't have a wicked government. They don't have any enemies in that garden. But he has dominion. Now watch. He has dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl, 
over the air and over the cattle, the, the fowl of the air over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the face of the, or the depth of the earth. Right? See that? Now, so God created man in his own image, verse 27, in the image of God created he him, male and female created them, and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it. So there, this dominion is for earth, right or wrong? Right. It's for earth, and have dominion over it, over all those living things that moves upon the face of the earth. Now, you know the story. Satan comes. They lose that dominion. They lose that ability. But know this. That dominion was over the devil before he got them to fall. They could have done what Jesus did when Jesus was tempted in the desert, in the wilderness. And the last temptation, Jesus said, be gone. James says, resist the devil and what happens? He will flee. So all Adam and Eve had to do was rather than entertain the deceit, the lies, as he pointed to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they could have said, get out of here. Because they had authority over the enemy. Because every creeping thing included the devil, who they didn't know was on that earth till he showed up in the garden. Make sense? you got to walk with me on this because this is all going to come together. So I want you to see that in the garden... On earth, they had dominion when there wasn't any enemy that they knew of, at least. And now that you and I are born again and God restores to us that dominion that Adam and Eve lost, we got a lot of enemies out there. So we need this dominion more than they do or did. So if they needed it then in the Garden of Eden when there was no sin... How much more do you and I need it? And what I'm saying is, we have to have it. God did not save us, called resurrection, and not give us the dominion when, he, when we ascended above all principalities and powers. And we looked at those scriptures last week out of Ephesians. Alright, does that make sense? Alright, because I want you to, this all has to come together. Now, what I want you to see is this dominion was for earth. Let's even put that on the board here. This dominion was for earth. Now I want to show you a couple of scriptures that, are, that, that you need to know this. And remember what we talked about last week? You see it in scripture, but there's always somebody out there to talk you out of what that word says. And put a but there. you got to get beyond the buts and say, I don't care what you... But, I know it says that, but... And here comes your unbelief. Let's stick to what the Bible says. And you can see that I'm not going to take anything out of context here. Go to... Genesis 14. Abraham's coming back from a war and he meets this high priest called Melchizedek. We don't know who this guy is. It says he didn't have a beginning. He didn't have any parents. So we think that would be called, and there's a debate on this, but I don't really think it matters, a Christophany, which means he is a type of Jesus, the high priest to come, because of the fact he had no beginning and no parents here on earth. But look what, look what this high priest says to Abraham. Remember, Abraham is the new covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. Watch what he says to Abraham in chapter 14, and I think it's verse 19. Now write this down in your notes, because it's not on there. And this Melchizedek, verse 19, blessed Abraham, and this is what he said to him, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. What does he, what does he say after that? Huh? Can somebody just say it? It's in front of you, so you're not going to be wrong. Possessor of heaven and earth. Possessor of heaven and earth. Now, if you don't see yourself right now where you sit as a possessor of heaven and earth, no wonder you're in the shape that you're in. Because as a man thinks, so he is. Be it done, Jesus said, according to your faith. You need to agree with what the Bible says about you or you're not going to experience it. If you let a butt talk you out of it, you're not going to experience it. 
You have to believe it to experience it. Have you ever saw yourself as a possessor of heaven and earth? Forget heaven right now. Have you saw your... You know where the church is at? You know where people are at? In, that they're not possessing earth. They're surviving on earth. They're in survival mode. Because of sickness, um, poverty, or a lack of opportunity, or what have you. Lack of... They're just... I'm just holding on, hoping that Jesus comes. That's not possessing earth. That's you hiding out on earth till He comes from heaven. Called rapture, if you believe that. Hmm? Yep. So, have you, and then is anybody sitting here? Just be honest. Raise your hand. Did you ever see yourself, or do you see yourself right now, with dominion, possessing earth? Most people don't. Now go to Romans chapter 4. Now your mind already talked you out of that before we got to Romans 4. Because you're going to believe what you're going through. You're going to believe that you never possessed anything good on earth, so you're just hoping for the best and holding on. No, you got to go back and say, no, I don't care what I'm going through right now. I believe what that just said. I'm signing up to be a possessor of heaven and earth. Romans 4. Yeah, great, but that's Old Covenant. No, it's not Old Covenant because Old Covenant doesn't happen until the Ten Commandments. Um, what did I say? Romans 4. I know that. I just want to make sure you're listening. <laughs> Romans 4. Look at verse 19. This is talking about Abraham. And being not weak in faith... He considered not his own body now dead. That's not the right scripture. So what is this, Romans 4.19? No, 13. 4.13. For the promise that he should be what? Heir. Heir of what? Of the world. Of the world. All right, so Abraham, Melchizedek, says to Abraham, you are, dude, you are possessor of of heaven and earth. And here we see that he's an heir of the world. Now why is the church given the world over to the devil? And we're holding on to the fort waiting for Jesus to come back. When he says, occupy till I come. Hmm? See, the church is not a triumphant church. It's not a glorious church because it's not a possessor of earth. It's given the earth over to the world. Or giving your, well, you know, what can I do with California? Nothing. That's up to the people in California. But we in West Virginia, we can possess this, this real estate. Let's get more. We can possess Clarksburg. Let's get even more. We can possess our own home or community or neighborhood, can't we? How do we do that? You have no clue, do you? Where do you start possessing earth at? Where you live. So if you're not possessing your own household... You're not going to possess the neighborhood. If you're not possessing the neighborhood, you're not going to possess the um, your workplace. How do I possess my household? Do you want rebellious teenagers? We got to start. You, you, you want a you want a whacked out husband or wife? No. You know, homes homes are a battleground right now in Christians. The enemy, that's where he's going. He's going to attack the husband and wife. Then he's going to go after the kids. Because a house divided can't what? Thank you. So how do we, we have to, to possess this world. It's got to, you got to start somewhere. And it has to be, well, let's even get even more. you got to possess your own body. No sense in trying to, you know, take dominion over your family when you're out of whack. Huh? So let's just start with you. You have to have dominion over your own body, which is your spirit is complete, perfected, and your mind has to come in, your body, your soul and body has to come in alignment with what God is saying and doing in your spirit. So that's when David said, soul, why are you downcast? David could have said, soul, you are not this, you're not that, this is who you are, this is how we live, and you have power, you have authority, and you start speaking what Christ did uh, what we've been talking about, you have to speak what you have experienced. So when you get your life in under dominion, 
taking control, then you can, you and your, you can, well, number one, if you're in control, you're not going to pick a dud for a spouse. Duds pick duds. A person who's healthy is not going to pick somebody sick. You picked somebody sick because somewhere you were sick. Huh? Why does these people keep picking bad relationships? Because it's something in them, it's a reflection of something in them that's out of whack. Right? If you were, if you were a businessman, and you're not going to hire someone who's been fired in their last 14 jobs. You've got a business. You've been faithful to your, your, your business, and you've made it grow because of dedication. You're not going to hire a guy who's not dedicated. Because you want your business, you blood, sweat, and tears made this business. I'm not going to hire someone that goes to the bathroom and doesn't want to work and hides out in the bathroom. Right? So why would you pick a, a person that you're going to hook up with, not hook up with in the days of it, be your spouse to live the rest of your life with, and they're a joke. Well, they don't have a vehicle, they don't have a job, and yeah, you want that, don't you? You know these dating sites, they, they say, um, do you have a car? It's like, what? Do you, you know, if they weren't rich, they got a job and got a loan and got one. Right? We live in America. Everybody can get a job. They just don't want one. Do you hear what I'm saying? So you take possession of your life. And God's giving you the power to do that. Then, because you're healthy, you look for someone who also has dominion over their life. Now you've got two people going to raise some healthy kids. And then what? Because who comes into the family to divide it? The enemy. But you're seated above all principalities and powers. So no family should ever... Come, they're going to come under attack, but no principality and power should be ruling over your family when you're seated above that. See, we don't know who we are. We don't know who we are. Somehow we've let them... This is why Paul said, don't give a crack the door. Don't even give a crack the, the, the door to the enemy. Don't give him an opportunity. He got in because we gave them an opportunity. See, people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And what I've been telling you, you're already destroyed right now where you sit because there's something you don't know. So we can't blame God for the divided division of a family. We have to blame ourselves not knowing. Because, see, we thought it would be more advantageous for us to play around rather than seek the Lord. Amen. Honestly. Come on, can I be honest with you? I'm not condemning, but you know, and I'm guilty of this too at times, at times, is that if God, if God put a timer on my television and then put a timer on my prayer room, where do you think my hours are the most? Television. So where's my, am, am I seeking God while I'm doing these extracurricular activities? No. See, Jesus said, when you seek me, you will, when you search for me with... All your heart. So the fact that you're not seeking is the problem. You're seeking entertainment, not directives. You're seeking movies and entertainment, not revelation. And we were having this conversation. I'm thinking, how does how does these preachers peter out? In other words, the Bible says, and I don't know, I don't even want to get my notes. The Bible says that a, a a student is not above his teacher. Right or wrong? Right. So why is that the case? Why doesn't a student ever surpass his teacher? Because they're always growing. It's just he's only above him because he got saved first. And he's got like 10 years over, under, under his belt more than him. But if this master or teacher peters out and quits seeking the Lord, and this guy down here says, well, he's not teaching me. I'm going to get on Greg's website. Boom! There he goes. He's going to learn the cross, new covenant. Now he's... There are people that I used to be under that I have so surpassed, not me, but the grace of God in me. So don't hear what I'm not saying. That they, don't, they, they, they know not. They're still in the 80s trying to preach stuff they learned in the 70s. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you peter out because you quit seeking. You're happy where you're at. And that's why Paul says, I, not that I have arrived, but that I press on. Right? What's, what do you mean? You press, this guy was in the third heaven. This guy wrote the new covenant. 
He knew the under... He knows the New Testament. And he says, I still don't know anything. I press on and reach forward. And that's him seeking. So you can't ever stop seeking. You have to always be seeking and praying and reading and opening your spirit and praying, God, open my eyes. Okay? I don't know where I'm at now. I'm all over the place. That's all right. Let's go to Isaiah 54. So if I agree with what he did, I then can experience it. Isaiah 54. It's on your outline, so you don't need to turn to it. It says, And all my children shall be taught of the Lord. Not taught of your pastor, taught of the Lord through your pastor. So you have the anointing teaches you. I'm just I'm just trying to I just point you to the to the Lord and He opens your eyes. And great shall be the peace of what? And that word peace in the Hebrew is prosperity, health, healing, wholeness. Look it up. Shalom. Look it up when you get a chance. There's a lot in just in that word. And that's your children. So that means you're supposed to be raising healthy children in a wicked world. And righteousness, you will be established. Thou shalt be far from what? Are you far from oppression or are you just always under it? There's a difference between being under oppression and being far from it. How far from you is ISIS? Far. Do you worry about it? No. That even because they're so far away, that allows you to live where? In peace. Like your children. So he says, you are established in righteousness, far from oppression. You're not going to fear. So there's no anxiety and fear going on. And from terror. And it shall not come near you. Terror shall not come near you. Do you know why? Because you have dominion and you are living from where He placed you. And when you live from where He placed you, you push the enemy out. How many saw the message Sunday morning? Okay. You need to watch it because I talk about how Israel was commanded by God to drive the enemy completely out of every allotted land each tribe got. None of them did it. They let the enemy live around them. When the call was, drive them completely out. Well, that's what you and I do. We get saved, and we let the enemy stay in our finances. We let the enemy stay in our kids. We let the enemy stay in our marriage. No, no, no. I'm good. He gets nothing. I drive him completely out of every area of my life. So Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Right? You know the story. Pharaoh, and he says, I'll, I'll tell you what, you take the men and go. He said, no, we're taking the women and children. He said, well, no, that's not the case. So here comes one more plagues. Finally, the last plague, Pharaoh said, okay, you win. Take the kids, take the women, take everybody, but leave your livestock. See, he's bartering. And Pharaoh's the enemy. He's the type of the enemy. Egypt's the type of the world. He said, I'll let you go to church, but let me, let, let me have your kids. You and your husband go to work. You leave your kids at home. Let's do this. He's always bartering. You know what Moses said back? I won't even leave one hoof behind. He could have said, well, you know what? I'm not even going to leave one cow behind. We're taking all... He says, I won't even let, leave a hoof behind, let alone one cow. We take everything. Pharaoh, you get nothing. See, what is these Old Testament stories supposed to be saying to us? Total dominion, power, and authority. Drive him... Well, he's still my finances. They seek the Lord about revelation concerning your finances, and when it comes, they, He gets driven out. There's nothing here you find in Isaiah 54 that you've got to do. Everything in Isaiah 54 that we're reading is what He's done for you. You don't got to do anything except believe it and act on it. You don't got to make this happen. Amen. Now watch. Behold, thou shalt surely gather together, but not by me. Whoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. So even the enemies that come against you won't prosper. Behold, I have created the, the um, smith and, the, and blows on the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Look at verse 7. No weapon that is formed against you, what? Shall prosper. Yeah, but... No, no weapon 
And you and I can both stand here today and say there have been weapons formed against us that's prospered. I have a divorce. I had to go bankrupt. I lost my kids. I lost my house. I'm, I'm sick. I've got cancer. I've got... I mean, you hear the stories all the time where weapons are prospering against people. Now, do you believe this? You're going to let some slick willy come along and put a butt here. Yeah, but. No weapon formed. And, you, and you'll see them come against you personally. You'll see them come against your marriage. You'll see them come against your family. You'll see them come against the church. And you've got to go after them with the weapons that He's given us. He didn't put us on earth without weapons. That's Remember the, the, the beginning illustration that I gave. Let's read on. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you, you will condemn. You won't allow it. Well, how do I stop someone? You, you, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, do you? What do you wrestle against? So you're seated above principalities and powers, so those that are coming against you, you condemn the act by going after the spirit that's, that's on them that's coming after you. You don't fight people. You fight the spirit that's behind those people, on those people. And again, that puts us in, do we believe in demons? And nobody wants to believe in demons today, as if they don't exist. So, you know, if you, the enemy doesn't want you to believe in something like that, so you won't fight it. Isn't that a pretty good tactic of the devil? Not to let you know, yeah, that, that demon stuff, man. That's, that's, that's not really going on today. There's no, that, that, it's that guy. It's that girl. No, it's the spirit. A demonic spirit on them that's attacking you. You just read Ephesians 6. It tells you all that. What? Let's read on. This is what? The heritage. This is your heritage. This is your inheritance. Everything we just read there is your right to live in and from. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So we have to speak from what He did. And that's number two. We speak from what He did. Now, this scripture, Isaiah 54 that's the voice of ascension speaking to you. What, what, what's, what's ascension? And you, that's just one scripture. There's a lot of scriptures. But Isaiah 54 is about Jesus. This is, and we are in Him. So what's true of Him is now true of us. And this is the voice of ascension. That's His voice speaking to who we are as a result of what He did. There's nothing here that I've got to become. Mm -hmm. This is not a prophecy for us becoming you don't have to learn anything to do this. This was already done for you, seated you there, put you in this experience. Now your eyes are open to it. You can live from it now. This is a prophecy of not becoming. It's a prophecy of being. This is who you are. It's a, it's a fore decree of your life in Him as a result of what He did. Now people are fasting to get to this. People are praying hard to get to this place. Already done. Well, why am I not living? Because you didn't know it. Now that you know it, you can believe it, speak from it, and live from it. By saying no to everything that opposes everything that He did for you. You won't, you won't let them... Like in other words, with Israel, well, we'll just let that enemy stay in that part of the land. No, we won't. they got to go out. I'm not going to let them stay there. If you knew... Now check this out. Let's say you leave here tonight. Sierra gets in her car and goes to the farm by herself. Okay? And John says, hey, I saw some movement around your house on, that, on those cameras they got set up everywhere, that little compound she lives in. <laughs> cameras everywhere, dogs, animals, lights come on. Um, so she goes into the house... And someone, uh, you don't have a basement. Let's say she had a basement. And let's say she hears somebody in the basement. Now, what does she do? Well, as long as they're not upstairs in the main, the main place, I'll just lock the basement door and everything will be okay. As long as they stay down there. Who does that? I don't want him in my basement, my attic. I don't want him, I don't want him in my yard. 
But we let the enemy in our homes, in our finances, in our marriages, on our kids. Because, you know what, because I don't really believe we believe there's a... We have a mental ascent toward the devil and demons. But do we really believe that they are out to steal, kill, and destroy? And he's equipped you to fight against it so there's no oppression. You can have peace and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Make sense? Uh All right, so... Everything on earth and heaven has been reconciled to God by His blood, and you are made to sit with Him in heavenly places above principalities and powers. All things on earth bows and subject to you according to His will. Ascension is about position and placement. Now that we are risen in power, He's made us the head, and everything else is the tail. We are established in righteousness, in position, in nature, in Him, seated, power and authority. We speak from Jesus' ascended life, live from that ascended life. Philippians chapter 3. We speak from Jesus' ascended life. Now, Philippians chapter 3, it's on your outline, so you need to turn there. Concerning zeal, Paul speaking. He persecuted the the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, here's, I really should start at 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Here's where we blow it. Everybody blows it right here. The only way, verse 7, can happen is if you understand your death and burial. If you do not understand your death and burial, you jumped over to resurrection and you're using God to give you anything that you want in life. Because you never died to your will, to your wants, to your passions, to your desires. Galatians 5.24 He who has been crucified has done what? Crucified passions and desires and you're no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. And those that have been crucified live no longer for themselves. Corinthians, Corinthians 5 Corinthians 5. They no longer live for themselves, but for Him who saved them. So your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. And you don't live for yourself anymore. Because you died. Life as you knew it ended at salvation. Now you're raised for Him. Once you get saved, it's not about you anymore. But you listen to the Joel Osteens, you got saved because it is all about you. And he's up there wanting to give you anything you have the faith to believe or what you can speak into existence. Because, hey, you know, it's all about you anyway. If it was about you, why is he in you? He's in you to live his life through you, which makes it about who? Him. Him. You die. And you and, you, and we're trying to use dominion and power and authority without doing it through our death and burial. And so I want this, I want that, I bind this, I lose that. That's and he's not answering anything no. because that's not what he's doing. Right. Now you preach this, I would say half half the people won't get saved. Because I'm not so I thought God was my genie in a bottle to give me what I want. Folks, there's things I want today He ain't giving me. And I ain't happy about it. So I got to say, but it's not about me. I died. But I really thought God was going to do this in my life. And I really would like to... It, who's it about? Who's it about? Him. If, it, if you really believe it's about Him, then you won't have pity parties of not having in fact, you will enter into what Paul said, in every situation or circumstance, I am what? Content. Because if I don't have it, two, two reasons. It's not what he's doing, or at least not yet. And if he's not doing it, then i got to be happy with it, because everything is for him, his glory, and it ends up being for my good. He withholds no good thing from you. So you have to realize, if I don't have it, it at least yet, it's not. It's because it's timing. It's not that he doesn't want you to have it. And then you've got those things he's not. he just really doesn't want you to have or be. And you've got to deal with that. 
That's where the flesh says, well, it's not about me. I've crucified the flesh. So shut up. We're not getting that. That's not what he's doing. And then we're content with what he is doing. What did he raise me to after he ended me is the, is the focus. All right? So watch this. Verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. What have you in your own testimony have you given up for Christ? That you knew it wasn't what he raised you to. See, when you when you get born again and you die and you get buried and then you get resurrected, there are things still in your life that have to go back over here and die that you didn't know. Hmm? Maybe you got saved, born again, and you're in the wrong job. What if you were a lady and you were a stripper and you got born again and was raised and now you're supposed to work tomorrow night? Now we've got to go back over and end that career, don't we? Mm -hmm. Huh? See what I'm saying? I'm being ludicrous, but what are things that we, we get raised to that's still holding on to us? We're like, well, that's... And there's things 10 years after I got saved I didn't realize I had to go. It took me 10 years to realize that's not him, that's got to go. How many marriages end up going because that's not what he raised you to? You don't hear anybody tell you that. You think everybody who's, who's married, that's the one God joined them to? Or did they join themselves to that person? Why do you think there's divorces? Because there's like, man, that's not who I called you to. But since you did it, you're with it. And sooner or later, that gets taken out too. He'll sh the whole purpose of what he raises you to is to strip you of everything on this side that wasn't him in the beginning. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, God hates divorce, but he didn't call you to that person. That's not giving me giving anybody permission to get divorced. I'm just telling you not to be feeling guilty or condemned if you are divorced. Because if God wanted you with that person, you'd be with that person. The fact that you're divorced is Him stripping you and preparing you for someone else maybe that you've been raised for. And that doesn't mean that you won't go back to that person either down the road. I'm not here to say one way or the other. Because the minute you go, oh, God's got someone else, then that, that ex wants back with you. And God says, I'm restoring that. <laughs> so there's no formula. It's you hearing Him. And, not getting, and, and recognizing what He's not resurrecting in your life that died. Right? Does that make sense? <laughs> I remember when I, I, I wanted more than anything... When I was growing up, not when I say growing up, I was probably 20. And I'm like, I really want to go in the ministry. I felt the call of God. And I wanted to go through the Assemblies of God because that's the church that I was in. So I, was, I went to Bible classes, did all the schooling and everything that I needed to do. And, um, and I got licensed with the Assemblies of God. And man, the feeling, getting something in the mail with the reverend in front of it. Now I'm only like 20, 20, 20 years old. And it's like, man, that is so cool. And getting to preach in churches and everything, and things were happening. So I moved to Arizona, and God, we, some things happened, and God said, you need to resign from the AG. I'm like, yeah, I know why, because denominationalism isn't from God. It's a, it's a party spirit. It's a, different, it's, a, it's a Republican versus a Democrat, a Baptist versus a Methodist. It's a party spirit. Galatians 5 says that's a work of the flesh. Party spirits, denominations, political parties are all fleshly because then your allegiance is to that person and not the spirit. And see, the Holy Spirit was trying to lead me into truth that my denomination didn't believe. I couldn't preach half of what I preach today to you right now. If I was under the assemblies of God. So I knew he was... But here's the kicker. I had to count that as loss. My wife at the time freaked out because it's like, well, then you won't be in the ministry. Because we don't know anybody except people in the assemblies of God. I had the, the, the presbyter wanting to give me a church in Arizona about an hour away. Mostly Indians, but... <laughs> So I went there and you know tried out and I'm like, no, I don't want this. 
thanks, but no. Guy got mad at me, but I'm like, that's not what, that's not what God's doing. But anyway, um, I, I had to walk away with no leads, no connections, no strings attached to any other ministry. I was like starting all over again. And, but I knew what God had told me. I had to count my ministry lost to gain Christ. Because when I walked out of the, the, the superintendent's office in Phoenix, Arizona, and it was a beautiful sunny day, I looked up into the sky, I remember vividly, and I'm like, oh my God, I can now believe what the Holy Spirit shows me. Now you think that's stupid, but when you're in a denomination, you've got to believe what they tell you to believe. You sign a little thing saying that you believe in the 16 tenets of faith, and you don't move from those. And I walked out going, oh my God, Holy Spirit, you can teach me anything. It's all truth is mine to have now. I counted the ministry, my credentials, lost to gain truth. Which, whose truth? Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it was, and that would be 89. Two years later, we moved back, and I'm in one of the biggest churches in Clarksburg. No connections. End up being the senior pastor there. One of the largest churches in this area. Huh? So, I counted that loss to gain him, but was it really loss? No. It was loss for me then, but it was to gain him and his will and what he was doing. He wasn't doing AG. He was doing something else in my life. And I didn't have a snowball's chance in hell to get a church once I resigned. I didn't know anybody. But he directed my path. When we went back to West Virginia, he said, don't go to the AG, which I wasn't going to go. He said, I want you to go to here, which was a non-denominational church. And, um, and I started speaking for that guy when he would go away. I knew him from the past anyway a little bit. And... Um, and he knew the senior pastor at the church up here, and they were looking for a youth pastor. There, there was my connection. God says, you don't need connections. I'm your connections. I'll make it. But are you willing to give everything up for me and my will, my purposes? Give up your earthly connections for my connection. That took a, my, like I said, my wife at the time was freaking out. We're not going to be on the ministry. What are we going to do? We don't know anybody. I'm like, I don't care. I'm going for truth. I know, that doesn't mean anything to you. But anyway, you, look, Paul said this, I count all things. For what things were gained to me, those I counted loss. Number, verse 8, Yet doubtless, and I count all things, all things loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. 2010, God started... Lose, let me go letting things out of my life I was losing everything getting dismantled right in front of me everything I told the church I'm saying you are watching a man it keeps getting worse you remember that guys I said if they, when's this thing going to stop then this bad thing happened then this bad then the enemy attacked my family attacked my health attacked my finances I'm like I got not what I got I got nothing left but a body to put boils on, I guess, if you want to do that to me. I'm not, I am not kidding you. But what I, I have to count it, I have to count a loss. If this is what he's doing to gain him, I gotta say bye to anything that gets in the way of me gaining him. Now, why am I saying this? Because you can't live the ascended life holding on to things he is trying to rid you of. Look at go to Hebrews twelve. See, people, the grace message today, you seem to think, people seem to think with the grace message today, you don't got to give nothing up. It's all keep anything, God keeps blessing you. That's not the grace message. The grace message is you've got to count thing, everything lost that gets in the way to gain him. The Osteens today are telling you what you can gain, not what you've got to lose. And if you're losing something, then you're not spiritual. Paul says, I've lost all things. I count all things lost. So whatever he needs to take out of my life that I may gain him, or he can place me in a better place, it's got to go. I'm not preaching, This is the whole message today is, I'm not going to preach dominion, and you think you're going to have your way in it. Dominion 
is for you to do what He designed. What He raised you to is what dominion is for. Not you holding on to things and trying to use God to get. And you look at Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Watch, look what he says. Let us lay aside what? Every weight. Every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. So he's going to take... You, you know, if you're, if you're a runner, you don't want heavy clothes on you. I remember one day I went running. I had, it was kind of chilly. I had a sweatshirt on. And I got like... Well, this is when I used to run out 50 toward... Like getting getting off of um, Adamston and getting and running toward Parkersburg on 50 there when I lived in Adamston, and I went clear out about five miles out and had five miles to come back and a rainstorm hit and I had a sweatshirt on. I got home and weighed all my clothes wet seven pounds. I knew I was carrying more weight coming back than what I did running. Seven pounds my clothes weighed and shoes. And I felt it coming back. So when you're a runner, the, you don't you want the lightest shoe. You don't want a heavy shoe. You don't want a Herman Munster shoe. <laughs> you want a shoe that man, that's really light. And you don't want something that's you know like you're trying to run and it's tight. You don't, man. That's just you don't. When you run, you don't. Your underwear's got to be perfect. I mean, everything's got to be perfect. You don't even. You can't run if you got to go to the bathroom either. So. Lay aside everything that keeps you from running effectively. Now that's in the physical. Paul says this is the spiritual. What's keeping you from running effectively? It's got to go. And it already went through the death. You've got to have your eyes open to it. And there's things right now that's not wrong, but wrong for you. Because it's not what He designed you to have right now. It was okay to have a week ago. Okay? This is where you can't get into, into things, you know, well, because many things you have, I'm not allowed to have. Many things you do, I'm not allowed to do. Simply because of my call, what He designed and raised me for. Does that all make sense? All right, so He counts all things lost, that He may win Christ. Watch this. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He lost everything. Many of us don't want to lose nothing. We, got, we signed up to get more. We got saved to get more, not to lose. But He's got to strip you of loss so that you can live the ascended life. You can't live this life holding on to things he, you, you died to. Now watch. He gets weird. And I count them but what? Yeah. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. yeah. That's a... That's a wicked thing. Done. You ever stepped in it? You want you want my you want I got two dogs. I don't my kid does. And man, I try to I try to keep, but every now and then and no one else seems to step in it but me. And then I've always got the shoe on that has about a million little cracks in it. Impossible to get out. And you want to talk I was coming to church where I think I told Kevin. I'm like, getting in my truck, and I, what is that? Oh, you got to be kidding me. Come on. I'm already late. He counts everything done. Now, I won't play with this a minute, because you need to understand. Oh, yeah, but he didn't really mean that. Well, then what did he mean? So when you have a relationship or a job or something in your life, he says, Remember we talked about it. He, he um, takes away in order to establish. Once He takes it away, you've got to count it as done. Not one, I don't want to poop back on my shoe once I get it off. So once He ends something in my life, I've got to say, well then that's done now to me from this point on. I don't go back to it. It's over. It's behind me. It's a weight. It's off. I press forward to reach what lies ahead. And what we do, we, we, we linger our... What used to be. A past job, a past relationship, a past church, a past event. Oh, if we could just go back. No, it's done. I don't want to step in that again. Did it, done it, don't want to do it again. Right? See your past. Everything He 
you died to as done. You don't want to step in that mess again. You got delivered out of it. That I may what? Now, yeah, but you, you really mean that, that, that that's done? Yeah, compared to Christ. Now, if you want to compare a past relationship to a new relationship, well, you can't say, okay, my new wife is not done, but my old wife is done. That's not a comparison. That's not the comparison that he's making. Or, this job is now done, and every all my friends are still there, you, you work in done. I've got a new job now, non-done. That's not what that's that's not the compare the comparison is I lose it if it was in the way of winning who? Him. Now Christ compared the relationship it done. It's done all day long. Because we're you know we're trying to be mean here. Trying to understand what does he mean by done? That I may win Christ. Verse 9. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. And that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him. And we talked, we started off seeking Him. That I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable, how? <laughs> Unto His death. There are things you have right now, but tomorrow you got to die to. It's okay to have it today. But when God, the seasons of God's changes in your life, can't have it anymore. Sorry. Could be relationships, not marriages. That's between. I'd say with a marriage, hold on and let them be the one to leave you. That's a safe way to go. Because that's what Paul says. If they want to stay, let them stay. Right? First Corinthians chapter seven. So put the marriage aside. But if you're in a relationship. And it's beautiful and God's like, that's cool, but tomorrow, mm, that's not what I'm doing anymore. Over here. And they they got to go. Now, how many hold on to the relationship and lose Christ? Hmm? I know. Nine out of ten. Can't do it. I see so many people, single, come to church, give their life, be completely complete, you know, I'm... Going, I'm going all out till someone shows up. Un, usually an unsafe person, and then now they're gone. I've seen this: husbands who come whose wives don't come, and sooner or later they don't come, or vice versa. So who's winning Christ here? What's more important? Jesus said, "I come, I come to divide the family." If that's going to be the case, I come with a sword. Because nothing comes between me winning Christ. I'm single right now. I'm saying there are there ain't a woman worthy that I've found single right now that I know that God's but that that would not destroy or weaken the call that God has on me. And I got too much momentum, too much revel, too much stuff going on to let someone make me start stepping backwards. Now that's just me. Okay? And there's a lot of women out there that can't, they're not called to what I'm called to. So if that, and so I've got to die to that if there's no one out there that, that can do that. So what do I do? If God come to me and say, you know, I ain't, ain't a woman out there that can keep the distance and the pace I've got you on. And I got to say, then so be it. Because the, you, you got to understand, I've been there. I've been with people and relationships. And they always pull you back. Always. The, the other one will always pull you away if they're not provoking you forward. They're going to they're gonna pull you backwards. And I've got to say, what's more important? The relationship or me winning him? I can't take that person that I'm not called to and start living the ascended life. They can't live the ascended life. They're, they're, they're stuck over here. They're going to be a weight that entangles me. Yeah, what if I'm married to somebody that's like, Paul said, you move on with the Lord. If they want to stay, let them stay. If they want to go, he says what? Let them go. Let them go. Because what's important is gaining Christ, not saving a marriage. I'm sorry. I believe that a good divorce is better than a bad marriage. You're not going to hear that anywhere. God hates divorce. 
Well, hey, that's a lot of things you people are doing right now. You want to stop? No. You pick on divorce, though. What God has joined together. Who the heck seems to think everybody God's joining? Can I, can I, can I sidebar? Yeah. I, I, I was doing a favor for a friend of mine. Can you marry my daughter and her this 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 guy? I'm like, yeah, but I'm gonna I want to counsel them. So I'm sitting there, we had about six weeks of counseling, and I'm sitting there trying to say, now what would you guys do? Number one, what are you gonna do with your money? You got your own bank account, you got what are you gonna do with, well we're gonna keep separate bank accounts. I said, that ain't gonna work. Oh yeah, it will. Okay. What are you gonna do if you have kids and he wants to put them in a private school and you don't want to, you want to go to public school? What are you gonna do? Well that won't happen. We always agree. I'm like, oh my God. What are you going to do when you want sex and she's not giving it to you? She goes, well, I have a cat. I never figured that one out. <laughs> I, I'm like, oh my God. This, this is not going to work. But I did it. I didn't even have the paper signed to send to the circuit court. And they were already separated. Less than two weeks. And they, I never did send that certificate because they she said they're not getting back together it's over two weeks now did God join them together so don't sit there and say well God hates divorce yes but did he join everybody together I don't know why I get on this but I don't, you're, they're not hearing this talk right anyway I don't know Verse um, 11. If by any means I might attain unto the righteousness, the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained it. So no, none of us are over there. Either we're already made perfect. Not, not, none of us are there either. But what do we do? I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. So I'm going to apprehend Him as he has apprehended me. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended it. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, that's past marriages, past jobs, past this, past that, reach forward unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark if she lets me. Is that what it says? Uh -uh. No. I press toward the mark if he's on the same page as me. Mm -hmm. No, I press toward the mark of the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's so much more there. Let's drop down to, I don't got time, let's drop down to verse 20. For our, now what does your translation say, verse 20? For our what? Huh? This is conversation. Conversations. Anybody have anything different? Well, you, you don't have your Bible. Yeah. Right? What? No, I don't. Yeah. Right. Citizenship. Everybody's got King James. I do. I got, got the real Bible. Yeah. You got the, you got the Bible Paul used. Um, <laughs> Randy, what is that right there? I, got, I didn't turn to it because it was on. Okay, but what, what do you got? Huh? She's looking it up. I'm looking it up. Anyway, it's it's conversation, and I think it also can be translated citizenship. Okay, nobody's got anything other than the King James, so we're never going to know. What's that, King James? No, but I don't have it. Well, can you turn there? Where am I turning to? Hollywood, you got a Bible? <laughs> Philippians 3, 6. I don't know what it is. 3, 20. 3, Philippians 3, 20. But anyway, as they're looking that up, our conversation is where? In heaven. Wait, how's my conversation? I'm on earth. That's going back. I live from heaven here on earth. I'm seated in heavenly places on earth. So I have to speak what heaven speaks. My conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So you have to find out what, you, it's almost like you've got to, you're in heavenly places and you just got to listen. 
What's he saying? What's he doing? That's your conversation. Don't say anything other than that. That's why I will, I, I will not... If somebody comes to me and says, I don't know, should I get a divorce? Are you serious? I'm going to answer that? That's not up for me to answer. Or should I stay with this guy or this guy? I, I'm, I'm sorry, that ain't up for me to answer. Unless you're looking at me with two black eyes and a broken leg and an arm, and I'm like, well, I probably should separate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a no-brainer, but to some women it ain't. All right? All right, so let's go to um, Romans chapter 5. Now look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned... Now that word reign has to do with kingship. So at one time, death reigned by one, Adam, which much more they shall receive abundance of grace. For by one man's office, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of what? Grace. And the gift of righteousness shall what? Reign in life. That's your call. To reign in life make, means nothing reigns over you. You reign over you reign over your health. You reign over your family. You reign over your finances. You reign over everything in your life. You reign. Now the Amplified says reign as kings on earth. You reign as a potentate. You are the king of your life. King of your domain. King with power, authority, and dominion. Over everything under your feet. Make sense? Now here's where I want you to go to Romans 8. Now that's not on your outline, so write that down, Romans 5.17. And neither is Romans 8 on your outline, so write this one down, Romans chapter 8. Paul says in verse 18... For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So where's, where's glory going to be revealed? In us. Now, some people think that's in heaven. No. In us. So every conflict that comes against you, God's releasing who you are in Him called glory. That means no weapon formed against you prospers. In fact, God takes that weapon, turns it around, and brings His glory where they try to destroy you. He manifests His glory in you and through you. Now watch this. Look at verse 20. Or, I'm sorry, 19. For the earnest expectation of the what? Or creation. Waits. Creation's waiting right now for who? The manifestation of the sons of God. What does that mean? That means, remember, Adam and Eve, we're going to go back to the beginning, what we started off with, Adam and Eve had dominion over what? Yeah. Earth. Melchizedek told Abraham, he is possessor of heaven and earth. And God said in Romans 4 through the Apostle Paul that Abraham is an heir of the earth. world. Yeah. Right? right? So, is the earth... God's creation. Yeah. It's waiting for something. Mm -hmm. What's it waiting for? For you to manifest. Mm -hmm. What? On earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. So do you realize your job, your household, everything in creation is waiting for heaven to show up. And you are the answer to every environment, situation, circumstances, your foot treads. Hmm. He ordains my footsteps, right or wrong. Right. So if you end up somewhere and there's chaos, guess who is responsible to hear what God's doing in heaven? Now, He may not be doing anything. You just got to just let it go. But if you hear, you got to speak. If you see, you got to do where you're at. 
Because God put you there so He can rule and reign through you in that atmosphere, situation, or circumstance. So creation is waiting for you to find out who you are in Him so you can live out of where He placed you in Him. See it? Now, we haven't even got over here because don't think this is the end. These are the tools that He that He gave you after He placed you. See, you're a new creation. He placed you in the place of ruling and reigning. And this is how these you use these to rule and reign with. And once you get this message under your belt, you're living the victorious Christian life. Mm-hmm. Supposedly. And then you may have to go back and renew your mind. No, you will have to go back and renew your mind on this. There's no doubt about that. You will renew your mind on it. So he says, For the earnest expectation of creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of who? Creation will be, creation shall be delivered from bondage, the bondage of corruption, into the glorious liberty of you, the children of God. So where there's bondage and corruption and evil and where the enemy's working, you are the liberator of that thing, of that situation, circumstance called creation. Now let me ask you this. When God said, let there be light, did creation go, nope, don't think so. We're staying in the dark. Did it do that? (coughs) Creation is subject to who? God. Yeah. So how did it get subject to vanity? Through Adam and Eve. So Jesus comes back and restores dominion back to us. So now creation is made subject to God who has subject the same hope because it's the, because the deliverance of the bondage corruption that is now in gets into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together. So it's experiencing the corruption. It hates the sin that it's seeing. It hates, you know, every situation, circumstance is, is, is creation groaning and travailing for someone to liberate them into the glory of God. And not only they, but ourselves are groaning. Right or wrong? Is that what it says? Yeah. And He's given us the Spirit. First fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, but what a man seeth. Why does he hope yet what he sees? But if we hope for that which we not we see not, then we do not with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know that we don't know what to pray. Here's where the Holy Spirit begins to pray through us as part of... See, sometimes if speaking is so important, and did we not see speaking is important? Mm -hmm. So why do you think there's a prayer language? So it can be spoken. Speaking in tongues is speaking the Spirit because you you may not know what to pray. So you pray in the Spirit and you're articulating, you're speaking, the Spirit's speaking through you because you don't know what to pray. You don't know what to speak. You don't know what to say. That's only part of, the, of that gift. But there's, there's more. But I just want you to see that this whole thing is coming together. If you just keep reading on in Romans 8, how it, we don't have time to put this whole thing together. We'd be here all for the next three months putting Romans 8 together. But I just want you to get a glimpse of what we're supposed to be doing here. It's not about us. The prayer can't even be about us. The prayer even has to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Make sense? Mm -hmm. I go to your outline. Mentoring objective. I'm not going to Psalm 16. Mentoring objective. Fully acknowledge your life is in Jesus. And it's His life, not yours. Ascension. Fully acknowledge your life is in Jesus' ascension. Acknowledge your life from God's presence. Everything Jesus received in His ascended, you did also. No buts attached. You are blessed, endowed, empowered, and authorized to reign in life through the person of Jesus Christ. Not through you. He does, you, 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 got to, you got to get this. 
You know why I can say this? He doesn't care what you want. Now, you may not like that statement. He doesn't care what you want. Because He ended you. He cares about what He raised you to that you now have new desires and new drives with. So when He raised you to, He puts new drives, new desires, and those are the indicators how to orient your life now. Does anybody have a desire to go to Africa and be a missionary? Anybody? Guess what? Nobody here is called to that. Because never even thought of it. Because he's never... I'm not even, it's not even a point of prayer for me. Why? Not, not even a part of my, my prayer because it's not what he called me to. It will never register in me because there's no desire to go to Africa. <clears throat> so your present desires right now, that which you hope for, that which you want and pray, and more than likely are him. So now you know what direction to go in. Now, let's say that I was called, one time I was called into the ministry when I wasn't. So I knew how to orient my life toward that, which that's when I started going to school and all that. So I oriented my life in that direction due to the desire he placed. That desire wasn't there a year before. That desire didn't come until I was around 20. So 19, someone says, what are you going to do? I don't know, I'm working at TV station. That's all I know. Make sense? Yep. Now watch. You are blessed, endowed, empowered, authorized to reign in life through Jesus Christ. Now, here, tell others from where you and they are ascended to and who they are living from. That is not what we're doing. We'll go to coffee and hear the woes of that person and we'll never tell them what he ended and raised them to and where they're living from. We're like, yeah, I can understand you getting mad. I'd get mad too. Wait, that's not even on God. That's, God's like, whoa, wait, that's not from me. Now you're speaking on you're speaking on behalf of you. Honestly, if, if, if you had somebody and said, I'm really mad at my husband. Look what he did. Oh my God, he did that. Oh boy, if so and my husband did that. Oh, is that is that the conversation from heaven? Remember, our conversation is where? Let's go back. Philippians 3. Our conversation, verse 20, what's it say? Is where? In heaven. Now you're Panera Bread, and you're now offended her in her husband. I can't believe he did that. Is that the conversation we're to have? No. Or I'm sitting, I'm sitting with a guy, we're having coffee, and this good-looking girl comes by, and the guy goes, man, I'd like to tap that. <laughs> No, you don't think that conversation doesn't go on? Oh, yeah. Hey, are we going to be real or not? Yeah. Oh, no, let's read. Um, uh, no, no. They asked Joel Osteen's wife what her, her, what her sin was. So let's use that. So I'm sitting at Panera Bread with a guy, and his temptation is to have a second cup of coffee. He's already on. Yeah, that's his temptation. That's okay. He's not wanting to tap anybody. He wants a second piece of pie. <laughs> Is that where we live? Now, would I go, wow, you're right, man. You're married, I'm not, uh, you know. Is that, is that the conversation I'm to have? But how many times do we entertain the flesh of somebody else? And our conversation's not in heaven. It's based on their flesh and where, what God ended. They still want to talk about it. That's not my conversation. My conversation is in heaven, on earth. So when you're talking to people, you've got to let them know where you're living from, and you've got to remind them where they're living from. And when that conversation's happening, the power of God comes on that, at that point in time. And you both walk away full of God, encouraged, strengthened, not wanting to go home and see if that girl's on Facebook. Huh? <laughs> I thought I lived in a bubble. You all live in a bubble. All right. So, mentoring objective: fully acknowledge your life is in Jesus. Essentially, acknowledge your life from God's presence. Go jump down. Now, tell others from where you and they are ascended to, and who they are living from. Lead them to speak from where He reigns. And the only way you can do that is if you're speaking from where He reigns. 
Make sense? Boldly declare they and you are empowered to speak from being blessed and make every enemy their footstool. So if that woman's mad you're talking to, you want to bring that enemy under their footstool. If they're unforgiving toward their husband, you want to bring the enemy of unforgiveness under their... You don't want to feed that. You want to bring it under their feet. If somebody's mad at somebody, you don't want to go, yeah, I, I, now I'm mad too at them. No, we want to bring it under their feet. You know, you know we, we, we reign over where they're at. And if they're not reigning, then it's your job to get them to the place of reigning and put whatever the conflict is under their feet. Make sense? Yeah. Now, how many of us have blown it? So we pray for others from that place of reigning. So when you're praying for people, you lay hands on them, you pray from the place of reigning. So, anyway, you can do that what you want, but that's... Now, next week we're going to go to the blood. And that's going to be a good one. Because you have to understand, the blood qualifies you, but it's way more. Don't, don't just think that's what it's about. There's a whole lot more the blood does. But the blood qualifies you to reign from this place. Because you know what the enemy's going to do? He's going to say, uh, yeah, but you're not perfect and you sinned and you lost your temper and how can you lead someone from a place of reigning when you... Let's say you're going to Panera Bread to, 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 to talk to somebody and you just cussed your husband out. You're going to feel like you can speak from a place of reigning when you were a raging lunatic at home five minutes ago? Huh? Now you're going to take the offense of your husband and place it on top of the offense of her husband and we're going to have a man-hating contest. No. I Remember I told you that I, I got upset at my wife when I was married hmm. on my way to church? I kicked her out of the car. We're at Hardy's, right down, well, wherever they're pointing at, from down from my house, and she started, and I said, get out. I'm not doing this. Get out. I can't believe you're doing this, and I've got to speak in about a half an hour. Get out. And she walked home. And I wouldn't do that today. That's not who I am today. That's high who heels. I was then. Huh? She had high heels on, too. Yes, yeah, she did. And Yeah, I did. You know what? I shared that, and she was watching, and yeah. she corrected me that she said I had high heels, and it wasn't a block. It's more than a block. Anyway, um, she's probably maybe watching now, but it is what it is. Um, but I had to go to church and know who, that God made me worthy to get up there and speak. The blood made me worthy. Now the enemy says, you, you have no business to speak. You need to go do this, that, and the other and take a few weeks off and get your head on. No, I walked in there and I preached a really good sermon. And to give her credit, she got in her car and drove and ended up being at the church too. And all went well. Still, we got divorced down the road. Um, but the blood, the blood, man, you got to know what the blood means to you, or you're not going to be able to rule and reign. The enemy is the accuser of the brother. If the enemy's accusing you and you're coming under condemnation, you ain't ascending. You're, you're, you're not living from that. I'm going to tell you, every one of these things are key to live the ascended life. Amen. Amen. All right, Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you would just. Open the eyes of our understanding. Give us a spirit of wisdom, revelation and knowledge of who we are and where we live from. We're going to have to renew our minds on this because we're on earth. We're on earth. But we have to keep living from heaven. Or we'll live like earth. And we're not supposed to live like earth. We've been crucified in the world. We live from heaven on earth. On earth as is in heaven. And we are the possessors of earth. We have dominion over the earth. Not governments. Not man. Not unsaved man. Not governments. Not even the devil. We rule and reign on earth. The, the Christian. And over every creeping thing and every principality and power is under our feet. We are far removed from oppression. Peace rules and reigns in our homes. We're established in righteousness. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. This is the heritage of the saints. And we bless you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.